Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this event that is uh, co-hosted by Staff Pride and the Edinburgh Race Equality Network on life in the UK as a migrant. Um, my name is Roshni Limke. I use the pronouns she and her. Um, I am the co-convener of Erin of the Edinburgh Race Equality Network that I just mentioned uh, with David Crichton Offord. Um, I just kind of wanted to use this time to welcome you, tell you a bit about Erin, um, if you're not already familiar with the network. Erin um, is a staff network, and by staff we mean including uh, PGR, so including uh, PhD researchers as well as postdocs, of course. Uh, we're a collective or a network of uh, staff of colour and allies. Uh, interested in kind of anti-racist work uh, and building an anti-racist community and anti-racist culture at the university. Um, if you're interested in, in joining us, please do. I will put a, uh, a link to Erin in the chat. But what I do want to do very quickly right now is just tell you uh, about some things that we have coming up. Specifically, October is Black History Month in the UK. Um, and we have a series of events uh, happening uh, next month. I am going to put a poster with the event into the chat, so you should be able to access it. Next week, we have a couple of Black History Walks uh, through the city, so that's on October 5th and 6th, and that's the Eventbrite uh, link in your chat. Um, and there's a couple more events. I won't uh, talk too much about it, but you can find out about the events and kind of uh, you'll see the registration links in the poster that I just uploaded to the chat. Um, so that's it really from me and I'll hand it over to Jonathan to talk about Staff Pride. Thanks, Rashni. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan McBride, my pronouns are he, him. I, I am uh, lucky enough, uh, privileged enough to be the co-chair of the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies, and that's for staff and PhD students. Um, intersectionality is uh, something that's been really important to us from the very inception of the Staff Pride Network, uh, and we've always had uh, uh, BME or BAME, uh, rep, uh, and um, it's uh, uh, a dis uh, disability rep, uh, trans and non-binary rep, um, and uh, we uh, try to be good allies to uh, to, to uh, everyone um, who uh, is not uh, my identity, and uh, and uh, that's why we're uh, partnering tonight with the Race Equality Network, and we. Uh, we hope you enjoy the event. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers, uh, the panelists, the organizers, everyone at the Race Equality Network for uh, doing uh, everything that you do. Uh, we have uh, our own event that our fantastic volunteers have organized uh, on Monday coming, uh, Queer in AI, part of our research seminar series. Uh, it should be really interesting about uh, uh, the uh, uh, network group um, of uh, queer people and uh, AI and uh, uh, STEM. So uh, I hope you uh, consider joining us for that, another free event. Uh, so uh, thank you very much and I hope you have a nice evening. Right, thanks Rashni and Jonathan. Um, that's, um, and we're always delighted for all the work that um, the EREN and the Staff Pride Network do. It's, um, it's really um, great to work with colleagues who are um, always so engaged with these issues. And I also, uh, I'm in some respects indebted to Jonathan for turning what was a very silly joke I made into an idea for this event. So um, uh, thanks for all that help, Jonathan. Um, I really appreciate the encouragement that you gave at the time. Um, but yeah, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. Um, so as you know, this event is on life in the UK as a migrant. And one of the things that you know perhaps immediately comes to mind, especially if you happen to watch um, Dave recently and watch another South Asian person on the internet make jokes about life, the life in the UK test, one of the things that often comes up is the um, exam that is a prerequisite for everyone to go through in order to apply for citizenship or settlement in the UK. Um, and I thought it'd be fun for us to maybe start with answering some questions from the life in the UK test to maybe think through what it means for 
um, our migrants to try and settle in the UK and what kind of hoops they need to jump through. And the interesting disparities between the values that Britain portrays itself as having through all of this literature and the reality of the situation that many migrants face in the country itself. Um, but before we do, and after we do that, we'll probably uh, speak to all the other panelists and we can discuss many of our own experiences with immigration as well as the wider issues that this is a part of. Uh, but of course, before we do that, I think it would be helpful if everyone got to know who the panelists were. Um, so I think we should just go around and introduce ourselves very quickly and then we can get started with the quiz icebreaker um, as we need to. So good evening, everyone. My name is Vivek Santayana and my pronouns are he, him. I am a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities. Um, and I have um, been in the UK for about a little over 10 years now as a student and now as a postdoc. Uh, Lauren, do you want to introduce yourself next and then pick who goes next after that? Yeah, uh, so hi everyone, I'm Lauren Tormey. I am a content designer at the University of Edinburgh in the communications and marketing department. Um, came to the UK uh, probably the exact same day as Vivek. <laughs> um, so we both started our undergraduate studies at the same time um, and have been here ever since. Uh, thought mine definitely to remain in the UK last year after nine years here. Um, and yeah, and have went immediately from being a student to working at the university. Um, yeah, so next, uh, Chidam, sorry if I'm best mispronouncing that. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you, Lauren. So I'm Chidam. Uh, I'm a postdoc at QMRI, uh, Kuhn Medical Research Institute, and I work in uh, cancer research. Uh, I moved to the UK in 2015, and it has been uh, more than six years now. And uh, I, I got my settlement and currently apply for citizenship and waiting for a reply. Okay, Maria. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Maryam. I'm a lecturer in the business school. I uh, have been working here for five years. I just get my settlement, so it's quite fresh in my mind. The trauma of going through the past, we'll talk a little bit about later. Right. And thank you all for coming along and um, being willing to speak on this panel and share some experiences which are difficult, but hopefully the insights that will come out of this today might um, help other people understand what other migrants go through, as well as ways in which we can work together to resist some of these issues. But of course, before we get to the more heavy stuff, why don't we open with um, a nice fun quiz, because everyone loves a Zoom pub quiz nowadays. So I'm going to ask you a series of about 12-ish questions, we'll see how many we get through, uh, which are literally questions taken from the Life in the UK test. Um, and you're welcome to answer them. Uh, and you'll have about 10 seconds whilst the, the multiple choice poll is open for you to answer them. Uh, and then we can um, just see how people get on and um, how many people actually know the answers to the questions that come up. So yeah, I'll just start launching them in sequence now. Um, don't worry if you miss any of them, it's not that big a deal. Right, so that's question one going live now. Which word comes from a Viking language? Is it A, Scunthorpe? B, leg, C, cow, or D, arm? More people, so the correct answer to that one was Scunthorpe, and you can see more people got it wrong than didn't. Uh, the logic behind that apparently is that a lot of place names in the UK are taken from um, Viking words, as the book says. Um, and Scunthorpe being a place name is the correct answer. I'm, I do not know the etymology myself, but that's how the question was worded. Next question um, is, which two adjectives are used to denote the monarch in the national anthem from the following, old, royal, noble, and glorious? Right. Um, most of most people got this one right. It is indeed noble and glorious. But here's a fun fact. Glorious technically is an adverb, not an adjective, because the anthem says send her victory, happy and glorious. And glorious is being used to modify the verb send rather than the noun queen. 
So the question is grammatically incorrect. Uh, right, so the next question is, when was the Emancipation Act signed? 1831, 1832, 1833, or 1834? Okay, the correct answer to that one, unfortunately, is 1833. So, Again, a lot more people got it wrong than correct, but if there's a historian who actually knows that 1834 is the correct answer, then please, by all means, do correct us. But the point is, the handbook for the Life in the UK text test treats 1833 as the correct answer. And one way or another, um, the point of the Emancipation Act isn't the year in which it was signed, but what the act represented and what the effect of it was. And instead, we get very pedantic questions like this about the year, the specific year in which, well, the act was signed. Uh, the next question is, when did the Vikings first attack Britain? In our genre of very specific years for specific things. Okay, you're all getting much quicker at answering the questions now. So I'm going to close these questions much quicker as well. Um, most of you got this one right. It is indeed 789. But think of the way this question's worded. Anyone with a learning dif difficulty that pertains to letters or numbers particularly would really struggle with a question like this because of how, well, because of how the numbers might just keep flipping around. I struggled with this despite not uh, having any such learning difficulty because I struggle to tell 789, 798 and there's a they're scant, they're scant decade between them. Um, so it's interesting to see how many of these questions aren't just inaccurate, but can also re recreate some forms of structural ableisms in the way the, the test itself is administered. Uh, but then again, you know, what is this test if not a structural barrier preventing migrants from settling in the country, persevering. Uh, right, I think I'll ask one more question and then we can possibly put this, um, finish this off. Um, and I, I'm trying to decide which one. I know, so maybe I'll ask two more just to keep it um, uh, to a nice half a dozen. Uh, right, so the next question is skipping ahead to question seven. Who won gold medals for ice dancing in the Olympic Games in 1984? And I'm delighted to say that a lot of people got this one right. It was indeed uh, Jane Torville and Christopher Dean. I don't have any profound insight to offer for this question besides the fact that this is a very specific piece of trivia. And imagine this, you're, you, can, you can get up to six questions wrong. Imagine if you're, not, you're someone who hasn't really paid much attention to the Olympic Games or hasn't really memorized this level of minutiae about Britain's Olympic history. This is one of the six mistakes you can make. And bearing in mind how some of the other questions are misleading, inaccurate, Every question can count, and this question might end up being crucial. Um, and then, of course, we have what is my favorite question in the Life in the UK test. True or false, racism has no place in British society. Okay. Um, oh, I'm not sure if the people who voted false voted in term, as a description or as a normative statement, but this is what I meant when I said that sometimes the values of Britain that this test puts forward are very different from the kinds of values we actually find in this society. Um, 
you know, I'm um, indeed the correct answer as per the handbook is true, that we believe that Britain is a society where racism isn't tolerated. But if you think about how the society is structured, the various institutions and how they operate, the kinds of inequality present in our society, the abuse that uh, migrants and people of color go through, whether it is structurally or whether it's structural form of discrimination or whether it's police brutality and violence or whether it's day-to-day -day street harassment and microaggressions. Um, racism is very much in British society, as, despite how much we would expect this to not have a place in our society, which I think is a good place for us to really ask ourselves what this quiz represents and um, what it really means for us to be talking about these issues and issues of migrancy themselves. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now. And uh, right. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan, for all those useful comments about how to set your pronouns in the chat. Uh, I just missed them until just now. Uh, right. Um, so that's the quiz um, from most of you did really well in that, although there were some trick questions that did, that did sucker a lot of people into answering the wrong questions. Uh, that's kind of the situation where all of us would have been in in the months or years that immediately preceding when we were doing the tests ourselves. Um, so I think it might just help for all of us to talk about our own experiences about life in the UK, both the test and our journey towards settlement or our lives as migrants themselves. Um, so uh, Lauren, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I can just briefly talk about um, specifically experiences with the test, which I took the test January 2020. And so, yeah, my Christmas 2019 was spent reading this, like, what, 200 page textbook of hundreds upon hundreds of facts about the UK um, and studying intensely for that because. <laughs> Even though you do only have to get 18 out of 24, um, I needed to get 24 out of 24 just because that's, that's the type of super student I was. Um, but I think, yeah, Vivek touched on, on, on some things where, uh, yeah, what you think might be the answer might not necessarily be reflected in what actually it is like living in the UK or, you know, or actual history um, of what's happened here. But uh, I think the thing about the test is it, you know, it didn't matter. It doesn't matter what life is actually like in the UK. It doesn't matter what the values of this country actually are versus what they believe it are. When studying for this test, reality didn't matter. The only reality that mattered is what was in that book, because what was in that book was going to determine whether you were uh, going to pass that test and whether you pass that test determines whether you get to continue your life here, which is um, a pretty scary thought to think about that a multiple choice test uh, can basically mean the difference between whether, you know, possibly decades you might've lived here uh, ultimately mean nothing because if you don't pass this, you're not granted um, the ability to stay here. So that was just my experience with the test. I did pass it obviously, but. <laughs> yeah, so like Lauren, I took the test um, January the 2021. So Christmas 2020 was spent, I actually got given uh, the books as a Christmas present from someone, um, which was rather thoughtful. Uh, and like Lauren, I, I had the same anxiety. The only difference is I tried to do mine uh, several months before I needed to, so that if I failed, I could keep retaking it until I needed to actually, and until I actually passed it. But it is terrifying when you think about it, how a sloppy pub quiz can make the difference between you staying in this country and not by creating more bureaucratic obstacles in your settlement application. Uh, Chidam, would you like to um, uh, talk us through some of your experiences? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, actually, the passing test test uh, was, uh, I think, one of the easiest things during my uh, immigration uh, experience. So the test like reading the book uh, requires some time and trying to memorize some of the facts uh, was quite um, unenjoyable, like the names of the uh, Haley the Eighth wives. So it, it doesn't have any value from my perspective, but I, I had to remember them. And actually it was one of the questions in the actual exam that I took. Um, so I passed the test. Um, 
And uh, from my perspective, the test is um, not useful and waste of time and money. Uh, and it could be structured in a better way. If, if they aim to uh, improve um, the understanding uh, of immigrants uh, about the life in the UK, it should be more about the actual uh, life in the UK. Uh, for example, one of the first struggles that I had uh, when I first moved to here was to open a bank account. So I brought here a European fund, uh, but I wasn't able to get my first salary on time. Um, so I needed a proof of address, which was essential. But at the time, uh, I didn't uh, have this document. So more practical and real life uh, information will be more helpful for any immigrant and for the whole society. So I can talk about other, um, pars other parts, aspects of my immigration um, experience later, once we go through uh, the test. Yeah, that, you're absolutely right, Chidam. Um, and I mean, I guess this, this, this quiz is a nice way for us to be talking about these issues, but I take your point that the test is just the, the sliver, like just a sliver of the real barriers that we face. Uh, Mariam? Um, so yeah, I took it, like everyone seemed January was a popular month to take the test. I took it in January 2021. I did the mistake by assuming it's easy. I thought I'm supposed to be a smart person. I'm teaching in the university. It wasn't easy. And then my main problem that I have a memory of a goldfish. I can't remember two things, which is the basic of the exam names and number i can remember everything else but names and numbers so i was te heavily teaching in the first term and i thought yeah in the christmas i have a lot of time to prepare for the exam start marking and i was like still there is some time to prepare for the exam once i opened the book i start to panic i was like i can't remember everything i can't remember names i just need to pass some of the questions and I start doing the test and one of my colleagues advised me, forget the book, go for the um, app where you download it and you pay four pounds or something. And I start doing the app, still failing every time. Until one week before uh, the exam, I was like, I need to study as if my life depended on it. Because the main thing for me, I couldn't wait more. I was late. So I either apply or I'm deported or I have to extend visa and it was, a big hassle for me and I will explain that later why but yeah it wasn't a pleasant experience the question is unrealistic and I used to quiz uh, my British friends by asking them the question none of them zero they say we'll never be British if it's that exam so a lot of information unrealistically to expect people to know and I can imagine even people who is their English not as they want them to be and how they struggle. And I will tell a later story of someone I saw also in the test center. But yeah, it wasn't a good experience at all. Absolutely, Mariam. You know, in fact, I did ask my flatmates a lot of the questions from the quiz and my flatmates started getting them wrong, um, which is, which I suppose is reflective of the kinds of inequalities and barriers that the quiz is supposed to represent. So if any of you um, lovely British people in the audience with your delightfully blue passports and um, your regained autonomy and everything else uh, got any questions wrong, then we do invite you to consider making a donation to the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. Um, I'm sure Lauren would have more to tell us about JCWI. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Lauren. I realize I forgot to give you a heads up about this. And I realized, well, I'm also going to put this link uh, direct to my uh, donation page. Um, yeah, so the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, they are a charity um, that basically um, sort of work in, in, in two areas, which is both to um, support immigrants uh, through the immigration journey, whether it's um, helping people who are experiencing issues going through the system, so advice or legal representation, um, but also uh, use your time to actually fight back against the horrors of the system and um, often take the home office to court uh, for for the awful evil things they do. Um, so it's kind of a twofold of both um, supporting the people that are affected by the system, affected by the system, but also working to change the system. Um, so you can donate directly to JCWI's um, uh, page, but I also put uh, all year I have been uh, fundraising for JCWI uh, with 
um, a fellow runner, uh, Tia, who I believe is in the audience. Hello, Tia. Um, and yeah, we've been uh, yeah doing a series of, of running challenges uh, to highlight uh, well, both coastal runners, but also to highlight just um, the horrors that happen in the world of UK immigration. Um, and so any any donations you have for that, be very, very grateful. So I'll put that in the chat. Thanks, Lauren. And um, I echo Lauren's sentiment here. JCWI do some vital work. Um, and um, I know my situation in this issue in all these discussions around immigration and migrancy is nowhere near as precarious the situation is for some people who are bearing the brunt of some of the Home Office's worst atrocities. Um, and JCWI do invaluable work in, in supporting uh, migrants from some of the most precarious categories, whether they're asylum seekers moving to the UK in times of extreme conflict. Um, or um, people who have been uh, in the UK um, for years and then have had their uh, residency questioned because of issues like the sort of scandal around uh, Grenfell, sorry, um, the, scan the scandal around um, um, Windrush. And it's really important for us to uh, recognize that at some, to some extent, a lot of us are in a privileged position in terms of where we are. But that doesn't make any of the traumas or difficulties we face any less as well. It's um, it's important for us to extend our support and solidarity wherever we can in whatever way we can, which is why I'd really invite all of you to consider donating to this, um, especially if, you know, you've got some questions wrong and you think you're really starting to question your Britishness and the barriers immigrants have to go through. But more importantly, because JCWI do some valuable work and it's important we share and support our solidarity with other people. So the sales pitch out of the way. Um, uh, right. Um, Lauren, you, you mentioned some of the, you know, themes that we already touched on at the start in terms of the difference in the values between what Britain is and what this question, um, what these, what the quiz portrays Britain to be like. Um, and you also talked about, you know, some of the more subtle is issues around, um, well, uh, the immigration systems, especially. Um, do you want to maybe try and frame the life in the UK questions or the, the test within this wider context, just so we can see this in the wider perspective that we need to? Yeah, do you want me to basically kind of read yeah. <laughs> the notes for here, great. Trying to give um, you the blankest canvas possible so you sorry. can actually bring as much of this in, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I, yeah, I, I've written a blog post on this and I've kind of distilled some of the, the, the topics from it, but basically, um, yeah, the UK immigration system it was specifically designed to hurt people and it does hurt people. And I just want to talk through some of the ways um, that it does this. So when we did, uh, so yeah, when you were doing, you know, the questions in the Life in the UK test, yeah, it seems like a funny thing, but again, that test could be, you know, determining whether you get to stay in the country you call home. Um, and it's reflective of something non-immigrants don't think of, you know, your ability to live in the country you grew up in, it's not questioned in the way it is for us. You know, you can be literally the worst person in the world and no one can tell you, you can't live here anymore. But when you're an immigrant, it's about proving your worth to your new country. If you cross an international border, you're suddenly judged on how valuable you are. So someone moving from New York to Edinburgh, you're fine. But if you move from New York to Edinburgh, you have to prove your worth. And if you're not valuable in the way that the government allows you to be valuable, uh, then you are unwanted here. And it doesn't matter how at home you feel here, the relationships you have here, the state sees you as having no worth here unless you fit into those one of those narrow boxes that you can say. And those narrow boxes you fit into, they come with rules um, they have to follow. Um, and this immigration system, it doesn't reflect the way people live their life. Um, and you either have to adapt your life to the constraints of the system or you can't live here. And this can range from seemingly trivial things. So the more kind of administrative side, for instance, on spousal visas, you prove that you're in a relationship with someone by uh, having pieces of postal evidence that are addressed to both you and your spouse, um, which might seem like a minor thing, but we're, in, we're living in a world where we increasingly have, uh, you know, companies wanting you to go for, you know, digital statements because you can't just have any piece of mail. It needs to be from like a council tax or, um, you know, a bank statement or, or a gas and electricity bill. So when companies are often telling you to uh, switch to a different type or switch from uh, postal statements to um, e-statements, you know, your primary form of evidence is, you know, it's, out, you know it's, it's outdated what the home office is asking for. Um, so I myself had it in, and encountered uh, where, uh, yeah, a time where I needed a postal statement that I was going to use to apply with my application, my bank straight up just like switched me to uh, e-statements without asking my permission. 
And like, and then I had to go out of my way to like ask them to send me this paper copy. Cause I was like, my life ability to live here depends on this stupid piece of paper. If I do not have this, then like, that's my application. Um, so that can seem like a quite menial administrative thing, but it has so much weight uh, when you're an immigrant. Um, but again, that's like kind of, yeah, the more trivial things, but then there's more destructive. So again, it's talking realm of spousal visas. Uh, if you don't earn a certain amount of income, you cannot live with your spouse in the UK. And I'll get some more of that in a second. Um, the point I'm trying to make here, you know, it doesn't matter if it's the more trivial things or the more serious. These are all kind of the ways that the UK immigration system hurts people. Um, and it was specifically designed this way. And when I say it's designed to hurt people, I mean people. It's not just immigrants. It hurts those close to immigrants. It hurts even those that aren't close to immigrants. Um, so if you've been following the news lately and you've seen um, news about the whole shortage of HGV drivers, and that this government wants to introduce a rather disgusting three months temporary visa to uh, recruit more people to fill those shortages. Um, yeah, you'll see that this system is hurting every single person that lives in this country because this government will literally risk having more supply shortages just so it can retain its tough on immigration stance rather than adopting some humane immigration policy. So I wanna briefly talk through some of the ways that the system uh, goes about hurting people. And again, starting with like the more seemingly trivial and uh, but it's not, but it's not trivial. And that's the thing. Um, you get into things like the application process and costs associated, uh, costs associated, costs associated with it. Um, so decision on visa applications take a gross amount of time. Um, and truly the worst being, uh, indefinitely to remain applications, uh, which the average times waiting time is six months. That's half a year. Uh, and that's six months. If you're lucky, they often take longer. Um, in many cases, you might have your passport taken away. You can't leave the UK during this time. Um, if you do, you withdraw your application. Um, but it also might mean you are left without like your most important or important documentation when you might need it. Um, so when I was applying for indefinite leave to remain last year, uh, it was also shortly before I was going through the process of remortgaging my house, which is the time that I need my passport to prove my identity. Um, I didn't know at the time I actually was able to keep my passport last year, but it was one of those cases where I had to get in touch with my mortgage advisor to be like, can I provide my passport now? Because, you know, the home office looks set to take it away for half a year, like when I need to go through this process. Um, someone once tweeted me that the home office took their passport away for two years, which is like, imagine two years living without the most important documentation that proves your identity. Um, there's a story in the news a couple of years back about someone who had to was waiting years on the decision while the home office had their documentation and they couldn't uh, fly back to their home country to visit a dying relative during this time and mental trauma or mental health trauma that caused them. Uh, the costs associated it might seem like a, a, a you know, thing. Oh, you just have to pay for it. No, like it is robbery. Uh, I paid fifty four hundred pounds towards uh, the five year settlement route I was on. Um, that's now, that would consider that now very cheap compared to what people are paying now. So for instance, my first application on my settlement route uh, was about 550 pounds. And I paid, I paid an extra 500 pounds to get a one day decision because I did not want to live in limbo for, I think it was otherwise two months you had to wait, um, finding out what was going to happen without documentation. But the next time I applied two and a half years later, that just the application cost had jumped to a thousand pounds. And so I opted to not pay the extra 500 pounds, uh, which was a position of privilege to do it where I tried to decide to risk, okay, I'm just going to live without, you know, having my passport for two months. Um, but I just could not justify the cost of having to pay an extra 500 pounds. Um, my indefinite leave to remain cost 2,400 pounds. Um, and well, to remind everyone, indefinite leave to remain, that is permanent residency, that is not citizenship. I'll have to pay an extra 1,300 pounds plus if I want to go about doing that. Um, and at 2,400 pounds, that's uh, 10 times the amount it costs the home office to process the application. They are profiting off anyone who applying for definitely made 10 times over. Um, <laughs> we're not done with costs yet. There's also the immigration health surcharge. Uh, so this is extra we have to pay to be, have access to the NHS. Um, again, I was lucky in that I, um, both times I had to pay for this, it was when it was 200 pounds per year and you have to pay it up front. So for a, um, so for a two and a half year visa, I was paying an extra 500 pounds on top of my application. Um, but it is now 624 pounds per year. So someone who's paying for a two and a half year visa right now, on top of all the other costs they have to pay, they're paying an extra 1500 pounds to have access to the NHS. 
even though, even even though we are already paying taxes into the system, like everyone else does, that grants them access to the NHS. Um, we also have to pay to get uh, our biometrics taken, so our fingerprints and a picture taken. This used to be a free process you could do at the post office. Um, now it's been uh, uh, contracted out to a company called Surface Syria, uh, who have uh, elected to say that, oh, you can travel to one of our six free centers in the UK that you can get your um, biometrics done. Um, but it's not really free because some appointments are free, but other ones are uh, literally hundreds of pounds for literally what should take a 10 second or 10 minute appointment just to get pictures, uh, a picture taken and um, fingerprints. Um, during the pandemic last year, I opted to go to uh, get on a train in public transport, which is not what I wanted to do, um, to go to Glasgow because I could get a free appointment in Glasgow and it was only a nine pound train return, whereas it would have cost at least 100 pounds to go to the one in Edinburgh. Um, and mind you, you have to do that, you have to pay that cost each time you apply. And so uh, most settlement rooms take between five and 10 years and you're applying every two and a half years. Gonna jump in now to uh, no recourse to public funds, uh, which is uh, an incredibly heinous stipulation on immigrants' visas, which means, yeah, we can't access public funds like universal credit. And you might think, yeah, well, maybe immigrants should live here a certain number of years before you're eligible for such things. But no, we're paying to the taxes in the system, remember. Uh, so we're paying taxes like everyone else, but we are guaranteed no safety net. And COVID has shown just how scary thing this is. Um, if you're someone who lost your job last year and you weren't eligible for any of the government uh, support schemes, basically you were on your own. So you might've been driven to destitution or worse. You know, there are people who have literally lost their lives because they have starved to death because they haven't had access to public funds. Um, so yeah, this system is literally responsible for killing people. And uh, it is also responsible for, um, as I was mentioning earlier, separating families. Um, so yeah, spousal visas come with an income requirement that, uh, yeah, uh, the British citizen, British citizen of the relationship has to earn 18,000, uh, 18,600 uh, pounds. Uh, and you need to earn that six months prior to applying. So uh, mind you, if you earn a minimum wage job, you do not earn that much if you work full-time. Um, it negatively affects people who are in part-time work affects women, uh, people who don't live in London uh, are less likely to earn that salary. And in refusal letters, if you don't meet the income requirement, the Home Office will literally tell you that you can keep up your relationship through modern means of communication. And by that means, uh, they literally think you can have a family life through a video call. Um, and this is, this is a legitimate thing that they tell people in refusal letters. Um, and I think there's also uh, a flip side to, to this that I do want to speak about, which is, um, yeah, the Home Office often, well, it's often important news about the income requirement and splitting up families. Um, but I also note that spousal visa routes are five years. Um, and so, and if you break up during that time, you lose your right to live here. Um, so imagine people that are in abusive relationships that don't feel comfortable speaking out about it. You might keep your mouth shut rather than risk losing your right to live here. So uh, absolutely heinous on both angles uh, of how, uh, yeah, couples are treated um, by the Home Office. Um, just because you have the audacity to fall in love with someone that's not from here. And the final point I want to speak about is detention and deportation. Um, detention, uh, so that's where someone, so detention is where someone would go to if they are about to be imminently removed from the UK. However, that's really not what happens in practice. 60% um, of people that are put in detention are eventually released from it. So basically people are put in detention in really traumatizing conditions um, for no purpose at all. And UK is the only European country with indefinite detention. So if we put people in detention, there is no time limit that says, okay, if we haven't you know, dealt with this person by X amount of days, we have to release them. No, people can be there for literally years. Um, and so it's kind of like the opposite of prison where if you, if you have a prison sentence, you're counting down the days until you're let out. In uh, detention, you are counting up because you do not know when you're going to be let out. Um, and when people don't know they're getting out, it leads to people taking their lives. People have taken their lives while in uh, immigration detention. Um, another way that the Home Office is responsible for literally the death of people. Um, and the way deportation uh, works in the UK uh, is if you've served a jail sentence of 12 months or more, um, even if you have indefinitely to remain in the UK, you are liable to be uh, deported from the UK. Um, so you can commit the same crime as a British citizen, serve the same amount of time, you can live a you know life uh, you know years of not reoffending, but the Home Office can and probably still will deport you. Um, and deportation is basically just exiling you, cutting you off from your family forever. Um, 
there was a case uh, I read about earlier in the year where someone was uh, ultimately deported, um, tried to take the home office to court about it, but they're ultimately deported because um, the ruling was that uh, while they were in prison, uh, their children still got good grades in school. And so therefore it would not be unduly harsh to separate them from their family. Um, so yeah, the cruelty of the system truly knows no bounds. Um, so yeah, life in the UK, it's really not some silly multiple choice test. It's one component of a system that was designed to hurt people and to keep people the UK finds undesirable out of this country. And so yes, there's my very long spiel, um, uh, which kind of just yeah covers a lot of different grounds. But if you are interested in learning more of that, uh, I will put the link in the chat, but I have written a blog post about this, which also has call to action points to email uh, to your MP about um, if you would like to read more and um, and email uh, your MP, I'd be I'd be very grateful for you helping speak out about how awful the system is. Okay, I will I will pause. Vivek, we'll get back to get back to no, what's, that's yeah. that's that's great. Thanks for thanks for that um, for such thorough and precise detail about the cruelties of these systems, Lauren. Um, you're absolutely right. This is not just a terrible pub quiz. This is a terrible pub quiz that is the veneer of a much more um, terrifying and brutal uh, form of um, oppression that targets migrants particularly. And the irony amongst all of this is none of this refers to what is commonly known as the hostile environment. Many of you might have heard news stories about the hostile environment and the impact that has on migrants. The hostile environment doesn't cover any of these things. The hostile environment refers to something that is much more insidious so Theresa May brought in the hostile environment policies as a series of measures intended to make the UK a hostile environment for migrants, hence its name, um, by making it difficult for um, migrants to have access to amenities and rights in the UK. So imagine all of this that Lauren has just talked about and imagine going, well, that's not nearly hostile enough, we need more. And the precise measures that the hostile environment entail are things like right to, um, right to rent. Um, are things like the uh, attendance surveillance at the university. Um, there are things like, uh, oh, uh, thanks for your question, Billy. No, we're not. Not after passing the citizenship test, nope. Uh, but anyway, so the right to rent, um, the immigration surveillance in the UK. Um, and to some extent, there was a time when even banks would uh, freeze your accounts unless you had a um, valid visa and you could prove your immigration status to the bank. Um, what all of this means is if you do not have a valid visa, if your immigration status is uncertain, then you could be in a situation where your landlord is evicting you, the bank freezes your accounts, um, and um, you do not have the ability to work in the country anymore. And there could be any number of different things you face that just make your life difficult. What that then means is it's a war of attrition. It is designed to burn you out and stop you from having the capacity to be able to advocate for yourself and access your rights. You know, if your bank account is frozen, good luck paying a lawyer. Um, and the, the purpose of all of this is very much insidious. And um, Hannah Arendt talks about how you can have a stand against tyranny against a tyrant, but when it's an entire system, when it's a tyranny from nowhere, then it's a tyranny from everywhere. And that is a very damning condemnation of um, um, how bureaucracies can themselves be co-opted by a state to be uh, a system of oppression. And that is very much the reality we're living through in Britain today in terms of what the immigration system is like. Uh, Chiam, you talked about some of your experiences and how the life in the UK test was um, very much a, you know, was very was very much the easiest side of this. I'm sure like Lauren, you would have had a lot more difficult experiences to go through. Would you be okay talking about some of them? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the process overall requires um, uh, quite like um, organizational skills and able to, uh, able to understand the documents and follow uh, the updates because the rules are updated regularly uh, every April. Um, and you need to keep your records in accordance with the requirements um, and uh, I did the whole process without any legal help, only for the most recent ILR application, I get um, help from university, uh, some legal advice. Um, so even I didn't pay for any uh, private solicitor or anything, I paid for only the uh, minimum costs. Um, I made the sum uh, this morning and in total it's incredible, it's almost 10,000 pounds for me, including my uh, husband. 
So I spent for the first five years visa uh, 3,500 and ILR application was uh, 2,500 per person. And I recently uh, paid for 1,300 for uh, the citizenship application and I didn't get any reply yet. Um, so the uh, time uh, and energy spent on organizing all these things and making sure that everything is in line what home office is expecting is important and um, it's really uh, consuming uh, in addition like emotionally consuming in addition to the costs uh, attached to it for me the most difficult part of the process was the travel restrictions so you cannot uh, be outside uk um, for certain period of time per year um, and also after you apply you have to wait until you receive a reply and during this period there is no way to get a, an update on your application unless you hear from them so there is no helpline or anything that you can uh, get any information during the process um, so probably after the um, lockdown and pandemic conditions people will be able to uh, empathize more how restrictive it is to be not not to be able to uh, travel um, so for me it was um, more impactful because I had to travel for health reasons so I waited in the UK to get a treatment for more than three months um, but I was in a situation that I wasn't able to uh, continue to work so I, I needed um, medical um, medical help and I had to um, travel abroad. So I, uh, I get the treatment I needed, um, but it was stressful because I rushed myself to come back to the UK to make sure that I will be eligible in five years time uh, for indefinitely to remain. And um, so after the treatment, NHS sent me a letter apologizing for the waiting time. And it, it, this was even before the pandemic, like uh, when NHS was used to uh, work before pandemic times. And um, so there are some statements in the um, regulations and manuals that there will be exceptions in depending on the application. But um, I think in reality, they are trying to make it as difficult as possible for the applicants. So they, they try to find a, a gap in the application to reject uh, it. So uh, every immigrant is trying to um, trying to make that they are doing, doing their best um, when they apply. And this costs um, lots of things, including health and mental issues. It's, it's not an easy process. And I think restricting someone's travel is, is not a nice thing to do, as everyone will uh, understand after the uh, lockdown um, in the last a uh, couple of years. So um, apart from uh, money and emotional um, aspect of it, um, the restrictions is uh, an important part, travel restrictions is an important part. And um, I cannot find any uh, logical explanation for these restrictions as well. Like if it's about um, the security, then I'm sure they, they can monitor these people even they are abroad. So, uh, if anyone knows why uh, Home Office doesn't want uh, visa applicants not to be outside UK, just let me know. Yeah, there is no logic here. To <laughs> it's the Home Office. Logic is out the window. Thanks, Chidam. That's, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. The travel restrictions are fundamentally so inhumane because the reality is a lot of us have families in different parts of the world. A lot of us often need to travel for own need. There, was all, there were also a number of academics who were um, denied visas on the grounds that they had to travel for research and um, they had, and as a result of that, they fell short of the requirement of the home office that you need to spend a minimum number, a number of days in the UK every year. Um, it's, it's brutal and it puts you in all kinds of like Gordian knots trying to navigate this. Also, it's been pointed out to me that the chat is not publicly visible. My apologies, I had not realized that. I realized I had answered some questions verbally without necessarily um, realizing uh, that no one else could see them. So I'm just gonna re reiterate what those questions were. 
Um, so there's one question from Billy. Um, after passing the UK citizenship test, are you entitled to public funds? The answer to that question is no, um, we're not. It's, um, it's only in specific categories of visa and passing the test doesn't guarantee the visa itself. You still have to go through the rest of the um, immigration processes that Lauren mentioned. Um, and I believe there was another question which um, Chidam answered in the chat. Um, but the question was um, how long we had to wait between booking the test and taking the test. Uh, and I believe Chidam's answer was that she couldn't remember, but it wasn't too long. It depends on the time you apply. Um, from memory, um, uh, from memory, this is it. Normally, takes around a month because the well, the minimum time you have to wait is a month because you can only take the test after you have failed your previous attempt. And you can only take the test uh, and you have to wait at least a month until you take the test. So the minimum time you wait is a month, but that varies depending on availability and whether there's a center nearby and whether it's all booked up. So it can be anywhere between a month to six. Um, and, the, and, you, and the tests are only held once every month in different centers. So if you miss an opportunity, chances are it's going to be a, a long wait. Um, right. Yeah, so uh, there, there's a question about spousal visas I can answer. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so the question was, you know, if both people in the couple of marriage need to have a job to be able to apply for spousal visa. Um, so the way the income requirement works is actually a bit different if you, at least I'm pretty sure this case, if, so if you apply, um, uh, for instance, if you are already in the UK and just switching to a spousal visa versus if you are uh, have lived outside the UK with your spouse and are now bringing them into the UK. If you have lived outside the UK and are now bringing them to the UK, um, only the British only the British citizens' um, income counts, which you can imagine. Yeah, this becomes uh, a bit of an issue. For instance, if one if a British citizen is like the you know, for instance, sole caretaker of the children, um, the Home Office does not care. The Home Office needs the British citizen to be earning um, that uh, that income. Uh, but if you are applying for what's called for leave to remain, so if you already are in the UK and are switching to a spousal visa, both people, um, uh, both both incomes can count towards it. Uh, but it's not a case that both people need to have a job. Um, you just need you just need basically to show that one through through one source or multiple source, however you meet the income requirement, um, meets that eighteen thousand six hundred uh, pound mark. Right. Thanks, Lauren. Um, we got another question in the chat. Um, is ILR or indefinitely to remain the same as permanent residency? Uh, Chidam has just answered that. Um, uh, and if you hold ILR and leave the UK for more than two years, you need to reapply to enter the UK. Um, so indefinitely to remain is not as permanent or indefinite as you think it is. It can get revoked for a number of reasons. One of them is if you are convicted of and imprisoned for um, um, a crime for over 12 months, the other reason is if you leave the UK for more than two years. Um, so it's not as permanent or as stable or as secure as um, you're led to believe. Um, but yes, um, so that's quite, uh, so I'll give it more time for more questions to come in. Meanwhile, Mariam, um, you said you had some particularly difficult and harrowing experiences both at the test center, but also more generally. You want to talk talk us through some of them? Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, so one of, uh, just to add to several points that uh, you guys mentioned, is um, that the institutional racism is just a translate also to the people who work there. It's just ambient understanding. Why is it one of the recruitment criteria that they should be inhumane and I had two experience with them and I saw someone also experience something similar. Uh, first, when I moved, uh, I was a student in UK from 2009 and then I had to transfer my visa from a student to employ employment permanent to, uh, to stay and that was absolute nightmare because one of the conditions that you need to go back home in my situation, I couldn't go back home. And I tried to, stupidly, I tried to rationalize with the home office and talk to them that it's not possible. They're like, asylum, asylum, asylum. I was like, I'm not entitled for asylum. And I saw your deporter sentence. I don't want to apply to asylum. I know how is the process work. And um, when you talk to those people, like there is no logic, you can't explain to them. And I have also other experience when I was applying through the process, I have a couple of questions. 
and I called the person who is their number book as the home office and the question answer was like no love sorry I closed the phone and I was like why you are treating us like a criminal I am entitled to stay here I'm paying tax for a few years and one last thing I want to mention when I went to the um, also the test center one person this idea of that they can identify who can speak a good english or not and who is entitled to take the exam so i saw a person and i was waiting in the waiting room for me he's he, he spoke fine english and they took him to the room and asked him a couple of questions who did you apply for and i think he was nervous and he didn't get some of the question and they were like no you can't take the exam so this person paid 150 but the officer decided that this person is not entitled to take the exam because the English in their eyes wasn't in it, uh, efficient um, and they ask this person to leave when he start to argue so it's quite interesting to see it's like even the people who work there adopt this kind of institution racism and the process is very painful it's create a lot of not only the cost and uh, the how time and consuming is the process it's also mentally exhausting i remember when i finished mine i was so mentally exhausted from just worrying about it yeah thanks for sharing that mariam um you are absolutely right in terms of just how this institutional racism is just perpetuated by people who often act in in ways that are so cruel and um, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you would have followed the news when uh, Theresa May, back in the days when, back in the days, I cannot imagine a, a time when I'm nostalgic for the halcyon days of Theresa May's term at the Home Office because of how horrible things have gone since then. But Theresa May once made a joke about how um, how there were some people she couldn't deport because they had a cat. And if you look into the context behind that joke, it's rather damning what that joke means. Uh, the specific case in question was regarding someone who used the fact that they and their partner had a cat together as evidence for their application for a spouse visa. So someone was basically trying to advocate for their own rights and prove that they were a couple based on the fact that they got a cat together. And that was then used to vilify them and used as an excuse for why um, we need to be more xenophobic than we already are in Britain. Um, it's astonishing just how deep this cruelty runs. And to be honest, it's a cruelty that we have to reflect on ourselves at a university. Um, the Staff Student Solidarity Network during the last wave of industrial action had a lot of work done in regarding the hostile environment, the way the university was acting as a, as a border police force on behalf of the Home Office. I mentioned earlier that the point of the hostile environment is to get private citizens to act on behalf of the state and to police each other's immigration status. You know, you get the banks to police your immigration, you get your landlord to police your immigration. We as a university have also been required to be complicit in this because the university's sponsorship status and our ability to sponsor visas for migrant students depends on how well we comply with the Home Office's policies. And there was a time when every six weeks, migrant students would need to attend a census to prove that they were still here. Um, and if you miss two tutorials in a row, you fall short of attendance requirements, which then is met with um, a rather interesting response from the university. Now, you have two cases, a British student and an, an international student on a visa. If the former misses two tutorials in a row, they get an email from student support or their personal tutor saying, um, dear so-and-so, we noticed you missed a couple of tutorials. Is everything okay? Are there issues with your health? Here are places you can go to get support. If you need to talk to someone about your mental health, speak to your person, tutor, student support, all of that. If you're a student on a visa, you are in, um, you get no such luck. You get an email telling you how this case will now be escalated to immigration compliance and you need to explain your absence as unexplained absences can lead to your visa being revoked. The anxieties that Maria mentioned that a lot of people go through, I remember I was a student on the other end of that email where I once received you know, emails asking me why I wasn't in class and I was ill. I, I, for, I was so ill, I just, it, I forgot to email my teacher both times, but it was all sorted afterwards, but the anxiety that it caused to receive that email just made me feel even worse. And it speaks to the kinds of inequalities, like the deep-seated inequalities in our society. And like Lauren said at the start, if you cross a border to get here, you are treated as a second-class citizen. 
And we as a university through our structures and our institutions are complicit in this in ways that we really need to reflect and change the system meaningfully. Um, we got a comment in chat about some experiences uh, Jonathan had as well, which I think are rather revealing of these double standards. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to step in and say this or would you like me to read out your comments in the chat? It's up to you. I'm happy to jump in. Absolutely, uh, I always knew you. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's I have a, an American husband. And so uh, he has, uh, he is privileged because he's not a person of color. He is a white immigrant. Uh, and so uh, in, in the British society, uh, he is rarely seen as a migrant. And um, one example of this is a taxi driver complaining to him about immigrants. Uh, and he tells the taxi driver that he's an immigrant. And of course, what does the taxi driver say? But not your type of immigrant. So that's the kind of thing that everyone else is up against, uh, that he hasn't experienced. He experiences all these kind of home office and the, the, the worries, stresses, mental health uh, challenges. Um, and it, we have had to go through uh, the same visa uh, challenges, uh, same process. Um, and in fact, we didn't meet the fiance or spousal visa limit. Uh, I had taken voluntary redundancy, I met him, <clears throat> and I wasn't yet uh, in a job earning 18,600 pounds again. Uh, all those, uh, all those uh, what are we, nine years ago since we met. And um, uh, so using the British immigration system, we would have just had to continue using Skype. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're perfectly happy for couples to do that. Um, and instead, uh, a cousin actually uh, found a BBC News article uh, about um, a judgment, an uh, EU court judgment, uh, where someone, uh, a British citizen living in Germany, had taken the uh, UK VI to court, UK visa and immigration, uh, to court. Um, and uh, uh, quoting the freedom of movement, uh, EU freedom of movement. So uh, we were then able to use this judgment. Uh, by uh, me centering my life in mainland Europe, we went and lived in France, uh, to then apply for a European Economic Area Family Permit under the Surinder Singh uh, ruling. And uh, we were, uh, we failed the twice. Uh, and got through the third time. We had to uh, go to uh, Paris. Clay had to go to Paris to uh, an agency there to uh, apply and do his fingerprints and uh, come back. And uh, we were failed the first time because I'd said that I would be going back to a job and earning money and I'd be able to support, I'd be able to support us. And they refused they said that that meant I wasn't centering my life in uh, Europe, uh, that I would be able to, we, if the visa was granted and we went back, that I would be able to support us. So they, they, it's, that's just an example of it all being a twisted system uh, against people who want to come to the country. I'm not gonna say anything more, but that's just some examples of uh, other experiences where there, uh, where there is privilege, even as a white uh, immigrant. 
Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And I think what you said there about the specific tactic that you used using established legal precedents um, is really useful to think about, but also just, you know, that's the bar we have to cross sometimes that you need to, um, you need to take the home office to court or at the very least use judgments from court in your applications or appeals subsequently, which just makes it that much harder for you to be able to apply in a manner that is unassisted without having to spend a sizable comparable fortune as the actual application fee itself on legal support and aid for doing this. Um, it's, it's, the deck is stacked against migrants in uh, so many profoundly disconcerting ways. Um, but yeah, um, it's really reassuring to hear that people have insights as to ways in which we can deal with this system. And also it's reassuring to be able to talk about this and see solidarity amongst other migrants, um, to know that we're not alone and there are people supporting us. Um, do, does anyone have any more questions about the issues we're discussing today? Mm. My question, but I do wanna add a uh, comment related to what you were saying Vivek, about um, those messages that are sent to students when they miss their attendance. Um, just to say that, uh, yeah, as a staff member, when it's coming time for your visa to expire, yeah, HR will send you a very strongly worded email that's basically like, if you do not like get your new visa sorted, like we have to terminate your contract. And it's just like, yeah, like I know, like I'm, I'm, I'm keeping on top of this, I'm aware of this. Um, and uh, so I recently stepped into a, a manager role at the university and uh, I'm about to be interviewing people that I'll be managing, which is great and exciting. And it's now breaking my heart that I am now like part of this policing state where I've had to email applicants that I'm about to interview to ask for their right to work. And I'm now becoming complicit in the system. Um, and uh, so the kind of point I wanna raise about this is that, yeah, the university loan is not gonna take down the home office, but I think as an institution, we need to decide how much we want to play into it. I mean, if we have to check right to work, fine, but like the wording we send out to, uh, to staff or students, um, and if the home office is not dictating that, we do not have to be complicit in making migrants feel like crap in the way we treat them and the way we kind of approach them about these issues. Um, you know, if we have to be complicit, let's be as minimally complicit as we can be while still treating uh, staff and students or immigrants like the human beings that we are and the valuable worthwhile people, you know, the worth that we deserve. Just to follow up with Lauren, uh, not only when uh, your visa is about to expire, even when you work as a permanent, and maybe I'm not the right type of mi migrant that you want, you get an uh, email from HR at least once a term or twice. Can you tell us where are you? Uh, just for a check for the home office. So it's not only the student, even the staff. While you pay a huge amount of tax, you still have to check where is your location because they need to know where is your location. And just to add another layer to this, um, there are a lot of employers in the UK from my experience with colleagues I've known and people I've worked with uh, who often support their, their staff for immigration costs, um, particularly re uh, providing either interest-free loans or uh, straight up paying for the immigration health surcharge and the visa fees that they need to incur. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of this is employers trying to support their staff and make working their attractive. But the devil's in the detail. A lot of the times organizations that provide this kind of support do so for specifically tier two migrant um, migrant visas or specifically employee visas, but seldom for things like indefinitely to remain or citizenship applications or anything that is more permanent. Now, a lot of this is to do with, um, um, you know, the fact that for a lot of employ for a lot of employers, they need to uphold certain um, restrictions and uh, uh, to be compliant with the Home Office in order to have the status to sponsor migrants to work here. Um, but then the flip side to this, the financial costs of something like an indefinite leave to remain application is roughly equivalent to that of a um, long term like tier two migrant application for the same amount of time if you account for things like the uh, indefinite leave to remain I and mean, if you account for things like the immigration health surcharge the issue is when people apply for um, a work visa their visa status is tied to the employer 
And if they apply for indefinitely to remain, then they have much more flexibility in terms of places where they can work. And I've known people who work for employers where it is not policy to support people's application for indefinite leave to remain. And part of this is contributes to this structure where your employer will only hire you as long as uh, your only your employer will only support you as long as it is so that they can hire you. And you as a migrant are seen in terms of your value to capital or your value to someone else's business or organization, but not in terms of your own rights. When it comes to ILR, that is giving migrants the ability to have more rights in the UK. And a lot of employers don't support their staff for that. And that is a huge barrier that friends of mine have faced. Um, but yeah, um, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so I know that um, Rashne said that she has something more practical that might be beneficial for our staff uh, attending this event to hear. Uh, so Rashne, would you like to come in and say something more about your UCU work specifically and the other hat you wear? Thanks, Vivek. Yeah, I just wanted to say if there are people in the audience that are uh, that are international staff, uh, it's worth knowing if you're not already familiar with it. Uh, the services of the the visa star, I mean, the staff visa officer. Um, I have put a link in the chat to uh, to the person's or to the page. Uh, the person in charge is named Sarah Hoey, and she is uh, really a uh, a brilliant person for support, uh, incredibly knowledgeable. So if you have questions, whether you're a postgrad, uh, so PGR postdoc or uh, an academic or professional services member of staff, please do contact Sarah Hoey. As Vivek mentioned, um, I'm also the, the, the migrant officer for the UCU. Um, and in that capacity, we're going to have a, an information session specifically for international and migrant staff on October 26th from 1 to 2 p.m. with Sarah Hoey and a person from University HR. This is again so that Sarah can tell you about the various services that she offers, your rights as uh, as an international uh, staff member at the university. Um, we're also working to kind of get the university to take more of a, a light touch approach to monitoring um, in the ways that everyone has kind of spoken about. Of course, this is this is a long, long game. I think it's also worth mentioning because. It doesn't seem to be, in many cases, common knowledge. If you're applying for a tier four visa, please know that the university is obliged to reimburse you. We are working on trying to get the university to reimburse for ILR as well. And hopefully that will come into play sooner rather than later. So that's just a few things, but I, uh, the information about the info session on October 26th, we'll be sending out via various networks, including Erin, um, the staff, uh, staff pride, et cetera. It's not only for UCU members, you don't have to be a UCU member to attend. Uh, so this is just information. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, Rashni. And it's really, I know we've talked about a lot of difficult things in, in this event, but I think it's really important for us to have that perspective of, what more we can do to um, uh, address the issues that we face. Um, uh, so we have a question from Stella in the chat. I'm just gonna read out what the questions are so all of us are aware of that. Um, do you apply for ILR and take the test in advance of your current visa expiring? Or do you have to wait until your visa has expired, i.e. you've done the full term? Uh, I think it is a requirement of that application of the application that you need to apply before the expiry of your current visa. And my suggestion would be to do the do the test, the life in the UK test, as early as possible, because there can be unnecessary delays in doing them. That's what I did, at least, because I knew that if I failed the test in January, I wouldn't get another booking till April. And... I couldn't wait that long, so I just did the quest, the, the did the test sooner rather than later, um, because it gives you more time to redo it if you need to. Um, and Stella has asked another question: um, Do you just continue to work as usual? Um, oh, uh, how far in advance are you allowed to take the test? 
That is a good question. Uh, we've got that question coming in twice. I don't know the answer to that because there is no formal requirement for what the, there's no expiry date set. All the application process says is you need to have passed the citizen, the life in the UK test. And if you have done it before, you don't need to retake it for citizenship. It doesn't give you any such expiry on how far in advance you're allowed to take it. So that is something I would recommend you get professional advice on because that is the information for that isn't as publicly available or visible. And that's another one of those things where the system is designed to create ambiguity and trip you up. So do try and get advice. Sarah might be a good place to start. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate something that Sarah has just pointed out in the chat as well. Um, Lauren said at the start that one of the things all of us could do is to write to our MPs. Um, and it could also be beneficial to write to our MS. Uh, and um, she also asks it could, whether it could be beneficial to write into our MSPs and whether the Scottish Parliament has any influence in this area. Um, I think given the nature of immigration being um, a matter for Westminster rather than being devolved to Holyrood, probably the MPs are um, the best bet. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just agree with yeah. that say that, yeah, it's, it's not, immigration is not a devolved matter in Scotland. So they might sympathize with the case, but um, yeah, ultimately they can't do anything. Um, I will say, uh, yeah, but an MP is also supposed to contact if you do have immigration trouble um, with the Home Office. Um, getting in touch with the MP is usually a good way to for them to contact the Home, home Office on your behalf and get something resolved. Hmm. Um, I will just say, just, sorry, so Vivek, you went over that question. The second one was asked by um, Zell about, uh, do you continue to work as usual uh, while your application is being processed? Um, yeah, it's this is uh, this is one of the ways that the, the terrible ways that the system is designed. Yeah, I think you have to apply like within, well, or at least it used to be. I don't know if it's still this exact wording. Twenty eight days before your visa expires. Um, but like for instance, with the six month waiting time uh, for indefinite leave to remain. Yeah, I was still working at the uni while you know my indefinite leave to remain, or sorry, my biometric residence permit basically had expired, but you are legally still allowed to live and work, but the thing that says you're legally allowed to live here, you don't have any documentation that tells mm -hmm. you that. But um, if you're a staff member, yeah, the, the, you just have to tell the university that you, you've applied. And I think you get a code from uh, UK visa and immigration yeah. for them to check. And uh, that's, that's helpful now. So that's actually interesting. I was going to speak to that as well, because um, I was in a rather interesting bind where I was moving from a um, student visa to a graduate visa. Um, at one time and the the rule is when you put in an application for a visa your current visa is considered extended until you get a decision on your on on your application uh which in my case meant my student visa was considered extended until the decision on my graduate visa came through which meant i could only work 20 hours per week as per my student visa and i could not be self-employed um which will which would not have been ideal for the situation I would have been in shortly after. Fortunately, my graduate visa came in just in the nick of time, like literally days before it would have caused problems otherwise. But you can find yourself in very precarious tangles like that um, because of just how this immigration system is designed. Um, so definitely go speak to Sarah Hoy. Um, she's a brilliant resource to have at this university. She really knows her stuff and is, and is uh, really helpful with her advice. And you might want to consider going to the UCU event that Rashni mentioned earlier. Uh, but besides that, I think um, all that's left for me to do really is, well, firstly, thank a number of people who have been instrumental in um, this event happening. I think firstly, we could not have done this without Robbie, who was um, handling all the tech behind the scenes and um, helping me keep track of messages that I missed in the chat. Um, and he had also painstakingly programmed 12 questions for us to ask. My apologies, I didn't use all of them, Robbie. I realized, uh, but I really do appreciate the effort you put into programming all of them. Um, as well as uh, Corinne Orton, who had put in a lot of work in getting this event off the ground and organizing um, uh, and getting the panel together in the first place. Um, as well as Jonathan, who was, um, like I said at the start, instrumental in this crystallizing from a silly joke at a Staff Pride Network um, lunch sort of social and the event that we had today and the discussions that followed. Um, so thank you all for really helping crystallize the joke into something that we could actually have some very serious and interesting discussions about. Um, and also my immense gratitude to our lovely panelists. Um, this would not have been nearly as informative and exciting an event had we not had such 
valuable insights um, as well as um, such uh, challenging stories for us to consider and think through. Um, so thank you, Lauren Shigdam and Mariam for sharing all of your experiences with us. I know that this is a very difficult topic for all of us to talk about and just seeing us use these experiences in a way that could be positive and beneficial for other people really does reassure me immensely. And thank you all for attending this event and for, for all of your um, really interesting questions. Um, and we hope you found this useful and provocative. And we hope this inspires you to think about what the immigration system is like in the UK and ways in which all of us can play a part in resisting it and showing solidarity with those affected by it. So thank you all for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.